The first impression that you made on the singles charts was, was Whiskey, Whiskey in the Jar. Mm -hmm. I think it was released in 72 and it made the charts early then in 1973. Whose decision was it to record that particular song? A lot of it had to do with Ted Carroll. Um, it was the first English single that we'd released. We'd released one other single and that was called The Farmer. I mean, it's a real collector's item if you can get copies of that. Um, but Whiskey in the Jar originally was to be the B-side. The A-side was going to be Black Boys on the Corner. And we thought as a laugh for all our supporters back in Ireland, we'd like send up the whole singles market because at the time we were very into being a, an album type band. Oh, yeah. And we thought we'd send up the whole singles things by doing a rocked up version of Whiskey in the Jazz. So it was a bit of a joke. The crisis period was uh, about 74, because that's when Eric left, you know, and um, we were in the middle of an Irish tour, it was New Year's Eve, and he was really just fed up with the whole, like, uh, star trip, you know, like, because we'd spent a year, like, travelling the world, living off whiskey in the jar sort of thing, and it was, there were silly things, looking back on it now, Eric just wanted to play the guitar, and get on with the music. So when he left, Gary Moore stood in for a while. And then uh, me and Brian were going to come back to Ireland and just, you know, start here again. You know, I'll just play around and see what gigs were going. And the money from Whiskey in the Jar was starting to come in then, so there was a, a few bob in the bank. So the management, um, said it'd be worth our while to, con to keep the name and to try and find, you know, you know... Uh, replacements. Replacements. Mm -hmm. So me and Brian had realised in the studio a lot of the stuff we were doing, we were putting down rhythm guitars and there was a lead, and putting lead solos over it. So we were working it on a two guitar lineup, even though we were a three piece, you know. And uh, so we decided to go for two guitarists, but the major difference was that we'd go for the two lead guitar sounds, you know, which was um, the only difference that would be from when Eric was with the band, because it was more a rhythm guitar and a lead guitar. And um, so we looked around, we, we found Scott and Brian Robertson, and we started from scratch, you know, we started playing all the small venues and, and building her up and we released um, two albums. There was Nightlife was the first one. The fighting was the next. And we just kept touring. We, we did start to build up a really strong following then. So by the time we came to jailbreak, which was 1976, we really had a, a very strong, live, loyal supporters, you know, and we knew we had a good album. The album was doing well in England, it was doing really well, and it got released in America. And the boys are back in town, took off in America first, and then England uh, realised that it was doing so well in, in America that they released it, and then it just became the international hit, you know. And uh, again, things just took leaps and bounds into another sort of division altogether than the one we were playing in. Ian Reedy is a very talented rock star, you know? That's what I see him as. That's, what I, that's exactly what I see him as. Very, very talented. He's come up with some great songs. And more important, how to get through to the public. And more important, how to get through to record companies and to get the whole thing off the ground. Like any gobshite now can write a song, can do anything, but to get it off the ground is the hardest thing in the world, so I think what he's done is much harder. Like, I, I know this sounds a bit cold, clinical, but actually getting it off the ground from a business point of view is the greatest talent of all, in my opinion. Mm.
you know, usually you have to be dead, as you know, and hope that somebody will find your stuff about a hundred years later and like it. But he's done it in his own time, and it's not easy. Coming from Ireland, it's not easy. Only very few people have done it properly. Mm -hmm. He's one of them, you know. I think he's done it better than anybody else, to tell you the truth. To do what I wanted, I had to leave Ireland. So it was like Cast 22 because the first thing, I didn't want to leave Ireland. I never actually wanted to go and live in England, you know. It was never uh, in my plans. I look forward to the day that an Irish band can make it from here without actually leaving here. Using Dublin as a base? Yeah, well, just everything coming from here, like, say, the artwork, the music, the recording, the management, everything from here. The, the name St. Lizzie was the uh, about, about 1970, I think. Where, where did you get the name from? Um, Eric Bell thought of the name. Uh, there was a comic called the, the Beano, you know the Beano, and um, on a John Mayall album cover, Eric Clapton was reading the Beano, so Eric Bell was in, a big Eric Clapton fan at the time, so he went out, oh, I'm only looking for a name of the band, he bought a copy of the Beano, and there was a female robot called Tin Lizzy, but T-I-N-L-I-Z-Z-I-E, and he said, we should call the band Thin Lizzy. I thought it was a dreadful name, honestly. What does this mean, you know? And uh, so we made it Thin Lizzy because Dubliners say right. Tin anyway, you know? So this was, was being smart, you know, the inner meaning, you know, that the pronunciation would be Tin Lizzy and the way you spelt it would be Thin Lizzy. And we changed the Lizzy to a Y, you know? And it was just about as deep as that, you know? <laughs>